Today's reading comes from Hebrews 11, verses 32 to 40. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Japheth, and Dave, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms and ministered justice and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. This is the word of the Lord. You may take your seat. You don't get as uh, epic uh, scriptures in the New Testament as that one very often. In C.S. Lewis's The uh, Voyage of the Don Treader, he's telling stories of the exploration of different lands and places in Narnia. And there's this moment where Lucy, one of the four main characters in the book, is on a journey with a group of people to a, uh, a land that is said that it's a land where dreams come true. And in, in, in the beginning of their journey, there is great excitement at the possibility that there is such a land exists. And as they get closer to this land uh, and the reality of it starts to settle inside of them, their mood of joy begins to turn because they begin to realize that a land where their dreams come true is also a land where all of their dreams come true and many of their dreams are things that they would not want to actually see exist. The sudden realization of nightmares coming to life, of dreams they wish they wouldn't have dreamed, of all that it meant in them suddenly fear and terror spreads along the ship. And in this moment, a great darkness falls on their journey. It talks about how this group of people, Lucy and her companions, are filled with fear. But as they approach, suddenly there's a little bit of light that breaks in and an albatross begins to circle around the boat. And in this moment that the albatross is circling around this boat, Lucy has this sense that the albatross is speaking. And as she stops and hears its words, she realizes it is not the albatross's voice, but the voice of Aslan. Aslan, the one true king of Narnia. The beauty of the, the Chronicles of Narnia and the books of the Chronicles of Narnia, not only are they you know, really beautifully written tales and stories, but C.S. Lewis intentionally writes in so much imagery of the person and the character of Jesus and the understanding of what it means to know God and, and Aslan as this true representation of the character of God and the person of Jesus. And in this moment, as Lucy is in the midst of fear and of darkness, and of a journey that she does not know where it's going to end. It's this simple phrase that Aslan speaks to her. Courage, dear heart. Courage. He speaks courage to her. And in that place, something rises inside of her that gives her the ability to continue her journey forward. I love this story because I think it casts a picture of what the invitation and the story of faith is like for us. And that you and I are being invited into places that will have to journey through dark moments. Faith will always lead you to the places you fear the most. 
to teach you that it's truly not what's in the darkness that has authority over you, but the one who shines in the midst of it. And as we as a church family are walking through Hebrews chapter 11 and having this conversation around what really is this thing called faith, what we find is that as the author of Hebrews comes towards his conclusion, he speaks of one last characteristic. He talks about courage. Faith and courage. And today, I want to speak to you about something that I think is desperately needed for all who follow Jesus. In every moment, in every culture, in every story, but distinctly true for us today about courage. When you stop and think about the stories of those that you uh, are heroes in your life, I think you're going to find something that is the same common theme as mine. When I think about the heroes, when I list the people or the circumstances, those who've gone before me, who've passed away, when I think even the last several hundred years, who are the people that when I think about their lives, something about it awakens something inside of me. I think about John Wesley and who he was and what he did in seeing revival break out and the Methodist movement and this great undertaking of the abolitionist stance in the name of Jesus, which helped move the transformation. I, I, I think John Wesley's a hero to me. I think about Amy Simple. McPherson, who pioneered the very movement of churches that we belong to, that her husband dies of malaria in the mission field, and she comes back to the United States as a single mom with a word of the Lord and plants a church in Los Angeles with her kids with nothing to her name. I, I think about Dr. King, who stood for truth and equality, but refused to move from his posture of love in the midst of all of the hatred and the discount that happened around him. I, I think about Jackie Robinson. I know uh, I'm, I'm a Dodgers fan, but I think I think we can agree, Braves and Dodgers alike, the, the reality of the first player in the major leagues who steps in as a black athlete and everything that he faced. I think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the stand he took against Hitler. You think about your heroes, you find one common thread that unites them all. Very different stories, very different people, very different strengths and weaknesses. One thing unites them, it's courage. If you think about your heroes too, I, I, I think you'll some, find the exact same conclusion. Something about courage speaks to the depths of our soul. Something about people whose lives amplify something in this realm of courage. They, they not only are the people that we long to be like, the man I want to be like, the women we want to be like, the people we want to be like, but it somehow not only gives me a vision of something worth following, it's as if something inside of my own being wakes to life. That's the power of courage. And I believe that it's this kind of courage that faith actually is inviting us into. And if we are going to be and do all that God has asked us to be and do, it is going to require great courage. St. Augustine, one of the uh, greatest early church fathers, in writing about this in one of his letters, he, he says this phrase, he says, hope has two beautiful daughters. Their names are anger and courage, anger at the way things are and courage to see that they do not remain the way they are. And I love how actually deeply this speaks to faith because fundamentally faith is this possession that we take hold of. It is this conviction that we now carry. We have placed our faith anchored in the person of Jesus that something has now awoken inside of us and that faith leads us to hope about a promised future we do not see, yet we know it's coming in front of us and that hope is going to awaken two things. It's gonna awaken that there is a lot that does not look like the hope and there is a lot that we must do to reconcile it. And this hope gives birth to courage because faith always leads to hope. And it's hope itself that will awaken courage inside of us. 
And even as we have walked through Hebrews chapter 11 and where you missed other weeks and go backwards and follow along up to this point, we, we see this storyline that the author of Hebrews is telling us that, that there is this thing called faith, this substance we now possess, this conviction we now carry, this thing that is alive inside of us that leads us to these fields of impossibilities, that our life is going to confront places that we cannot walk through on our own, the places where we do not have what it takes, but yet faith is inviting us into to this journey of belief that somehow God is in the midst of these fields of impossibilities, but God doesn't send us alone. He gives us a map and a compass and a, a way, a guidebook, and he gives us this shield that we desperately need because lies and brokenness are around us. And as we pick this up, the author of Hebrews says, oh, but one more thing, one more thing that God wants to give you that faith is connected to. Courage. Courage. And this incredible passage that Trenton read is these stories of faith and courage. And you got to love it when an author of the Bible or a preacher goes, I don't have even time to tell you about all of these things, but let me shotgun the list, right? This letter would be so long if I kept breaking these down. But let me tell you, and the beautiful thing is that the author tells us these stories of people of profound courage who, who experience radical victory and triumph in the midst of it, but also people in profound courage who suffered great loss and devastation. And the line, oh, the line in the midst of it that I, I don't know about you, but somehow there's something in my heart that just cries out for where, where the scripture says, and the world was not worthy of them. Could it, could it be that there is a life to be lived? That such things could be said about it. And it's this invitation to courage. And before that, the author of Hebrews tells us four stories again. I don't know why that's the governing mechanism. You can see through all of Hebrews 11, I'm going to make a point, tell you four stories, make a point, tell you four stories, make a point, tell you four stories. But he, he does that yet again. And he tells a story about Moses and he tells a story about the Red Sea and he tells a story about Jericho and he tells a story about Rahab. And these four stories are these stories about faith and courage. But but I want us to see before we look at these invitations is the heart of what I think God is trying to speak to us about courage. Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, he writes this passage. It says this, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Paul has just written this letter to this church that he planted, he loves, and he knows that is facing really profound difficulties. That after his planting of the church, false teachers and false apostles have come and they have tried to dissuade people from standing on the gospel that Paul preached. These super apostles have imposed their own ideas and ideology, moving people away from faithfulness to the gospel towards visions of self and selfishness. They're facing the brokenness of their own flesh. They long for the spirit, but don't know how to steward it. This is a church on fire, a church in mess, a church full of false ideas. And Paul's writing them to bring them back. This is a pastoral heart of calling them to the life that they're truly called to live in the midst of the fact that they're facing persecution as giving their life to Jesus. And it's this last final pastoral word, 1 Corinthians 16, is, is Paul writing his greetings. It's, a, it's almost like he's wrapped up his letter, but in the middle of wrapping up his letter, it's almost like his pastoral mind says, one last thing. You gotta be on your guard. You gotta stand firm in the faith. You gotta be courageous. Be strong. It's almost like Paul saying, if you're gonna do everything I just wrote you, you, you gotta do this. This is what makes everything else possible. And he calls them to this picture of faith. And it's really interesting when you look at the Greek and the Greek etymology, these are actually difficult to translate words. I think the translator accurately and perfectly writes them, but the reason they're difficult to translate is because Paul's actually using idioms from Plato to describe what he means. So the phrases he uses are cultural phrases that are rightly translated to this, but when you look at them in their detail, they kind of say these unique things and these four phrases to be on your guard, to stand firm, to have courage, to be strong. This 
picture of being on your guard. It, it literally just means to stay awake. To stay awake. What, a, what an initial word. Can I just tell you that in this life of faith, one of the greatest decisions you will have to make is to stay awake. How life wants to lull you to sleep. How comfort and wealth and the pursuit of status will lull you to sleep. And Paul's word to them in this final moment of how to live this life, he says, stay awake. Stay awake. And this phrase, stand firm, again, it's this phrase that Plato uses where, where he's talking about this idea of an army, that there is this resistance that cannot move you. To stand firm, to become unmovable in your posture, no matter what comes your way. And Paul says, this is the moment. You have to stay awake. And there is this now posture of faith. It's not just a standing firm. It's a standing firm in faith. There is this thing you now have to choose to stand firm in the midst of your faith that what resistance comes towards you will not move you from this one thing you're holding on to. And then he says, literally, act like a man. It's an interesting phrase. Paul's clearly writing 1 Corinthians to men and women. He has instructions for women all over the book. But he pulls this phrase directly from Plato. I think there is a statement here for men, but I think there is a invitation here for all of us. Because Plato wrote a lot. Plato, this ancient philosopher who's in many ways the giant of the ancient world and whose thoughts and ideas still uh, absolutely scatter into our world today. In writing about courage, he talks about this virtue that should define someone. But he ultimately, as he talks about courage and in this call to act like somebody courageous, to act as one should, he defines courage as two things. First, courage is not the absence of fear. This is something that many people have spoken about, yet still we slip into it. We, we often find ourselves in moments we feel afraid as if the feeling of fear is somehow the reality of our lack of courage. No, friends, you don't even begin the journey of courage until the substance of fear shows up. You do not need to feel concerned that fear has entered into your story. You living rightly should be walking places that make you afraid. Do not fear fear, but do not avoid fear. We have to learn how to be people that recognize that God is leading our lives into distinct places of fear. And remember, this is why I've talked about often that in a heightened emotional world, where we have taken emotions, which are good things, but made them things they're not. We've made them authorities. We've made them truth tellers. Our emotions matter. My emotions are not telling me the truth all the time. My emotions matter. My emotions are not my authority. But because we have vaulted emotions to this place that it can't be, then we make faith an emotion. Faith is not an emotion. And so when I can't register that feeling I associate with faith, then I don't know how to stand in faith. But when you begin to realize that faith is something you possess that is going to walk with you when all of the feelings of faith go away, that's when you begin to realize I can actually take hold of something. Everything in my emotional world tells me trouble is near. Everything in my emotional world says I can't do this. Everything in my emotional world looks at what's in front of me and says I'll lose. And I don't want to lose. And losing has consequences. There is no feeling of faith in that moment. There is a substance of another person. And it's there in those moments when fear wakes up that I hold on to what is actually now a position within me. I hold on to faith. And see, it is this posture of faith that says, when I'm afraid, Plato would say, courage is that I will face my fear. But it's not just the first that I will face my fear. Courage will always look a certain way. Because in the midst of decisions, you will always have to make a choice of self-preservation and self-blessing. But as Plato would say, courage will always choose selflessness for the sake of loving others. It is not courage if the recipient of benefit is you. Courage uniquely 
has these two dimensions to face what you fear and to choose selfless love for somebody else in the midst of it. And this is what Plato means when he says, act like a man. And this is what Paul means when he says the same thing. He says to stay awake, to not be movable, to face your fear and to realize that selfless love is in front of you and it has to be chosen. And this last word, be strong. This is probably the one that we misunderstand the most. Because the invitation in the way it's phrased, again, is a statement we hear like, man, I've got I've to white knuckle this thing. I've got to find something. Okay, I've got to dig deeper. And that works sometimes. It works sometimes. When the journeys get real dark, though, you, you don't know where to find that thing. And see, even the, the biblical story, right? This, this phrase that's repeated all over the scriptures. It, Moses, before he passes away, speaks to the nation of Israel in commissioning Joshua, and he says, be strong and courageous. Joshua, about to lead the armies of God to take the promised land, and God speaks to him, be strong and courageous. These words echo into the Psalms and the Proverbs all over different places. You see it. And even David, as he's about to pass away and hand the kingdom to Solomon, looks at Solomon and says, be strong and courageous. All of them echoing the same promise. The Lord will be with you. Even Jesus in his phrase in John 16, you will face troubles of many kind. But take heart. The same word as courage. Take heart because I have overcome the world and I did not leave you as orphans. Jesus incarnating the very words of the Lord. And we hear this and they're beautiful and they're true. Be strong and courageous. There is something here calling us to be strong and courageous, but what we misunderstand is that the strength we are being called to is not something we possess in and of ourselves. Friends, the truth is that to learn how to be strong and courageous starts with learning how to be weak and courageous. Because the strength that God is giving you is not something you can muster up on your own. The strength that God is giving you is when Paul says in Corinthians, I have not come to give you wise words or a demonstration of my own abilities. I have come in weakness and fear and trembling that your faith might be placed in the power of God. See, it's a faith that leads us to a weakness that leads us to a strengthening. I want you to be strong and courageous, but you have to understand to become strong and courageous, you're gonna to have to learn how to become weak and courageous first. Because this word, to be strong, is actually to be strengthened. Paul only uses it one other time. Ephesians 3.16, he says, I pray out of his glorious riches that he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So what the author of Hebrews is saying is this journey of faith, you're, you're gonna have to learn how to stay awake. You're, you're, gonna have to, you're gonna have to hold on to this unmovable thing you've now declared that you possess. You're gonna have to actually face your fears and you're gonna to have to find selfless love in the midst of circumstances where you could choose self-preservation and self-benefit. And he says, but, but, but to do this, you're gonna to have to be strengthened by something that isn't you. A strengthening of the spirit that suddenly brings life to courage. Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians, what the author of Hebrews is trying to tell us is that faith is calling you to courage. But faith itself is the very thing that possesses the ability to give you the strength of that courage. Faith and courage are not pictures of your own self-effort. Faith and courage are pictures of abiding in Christ. 
This is where earlier in another passage, the author of Hebrews says this very mysterious phrase that on the surface feels quite confusing, to strive to abide. What does that mean? It means you don't have to earn anything. Grace is really grace. Salvation is really salvation. It really is the finished work of the cross and every single ounce of blessing of Jesus has now been placed on you. But there is effort. It's just not the effort of works and the effort of earning. It is the effort to get to abiding. To contend, to come to the place where I stand in weakness with Jesus. And it's there that the spirit of God begins to strengthen what remains. And courage starts to wake up because it's a courage strengthened from his spirit, not from my own abilities. And this is the kind of strength and the kind of courage that we need. The author of Hebrews, right before the passage that Trenton read to us, tells us this. He says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as greater value than the treasures of Egypt. By the way, how remarkable that the author of Hebrews says, even though they did not know him, when they acted in faithfulness, they were actually looking unto Christ. Moses acted in allegiance and in faithfulness unto Jesus because he was looking ahead to what he could not name recognizing though that what he was looking ahead to was Jesus himself. And the same is true for us who now look back because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who was invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover, the application of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Abraham, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. Four stories they're trying to teach you about faith and courage. Moses had to face Pharaoh. And it was in faith he found his courage. And the real issue is that Moses, friends, could have stayed asleep. Moses could have stayed asleep. He had a real nice place to sleep, especially in an ancient world but he had to find the courage to give up his personal ease to choose to belong to the suffering of his people. God is giving you the courage to face the fear of choosing the narrow road. The narrow road will always cost you. Fear, we're afraid of it. Faith is the substance that awakens the courage to stand in the truth, even the cost and the suffering that it brings. Israel had to face the Red Sea. In faith, they found their courage. Imagine having a Red Sea in front of you and an army that wants to kill you behind you. It's a story of vulnerability. story of vulnerability. Israel had to put themselves in a position of greatest vulnerability. My guess is you've got some Red Seas in front of you and some armies behind you. And the vulnerability it creates feels pretty fearful. God has given you the courage to face the fears of being vulnerable. Faith will make you vulnerable. This is why many of us say we live in faith, but do not. Because we want to do everything we can to be self-sufficient. Faith will make you vulnerable. The armies had to face Jericho. And in faith, they found their courage. And the interesting thing is that while they had a battle in front of them, I guess is none of them wanted to fight 
the real faith was to trust God to fight their battle on their behalf. To pick up their worship and not their warfare. The armies had to find courage to trust God's plan, not to choose to fight their own battles. God is giving you the courage to face the fear of battles you can't win without his help. And my guess is there's some battles that you're facing that you've been, you've been trying to go to war with, even though it feels like a lost cause. But you're afraid of what it means to actually drop your sword and pick up your worship. See, Rahab had to face which side she would choose. In faith, she found her courage. Would she choose this somehow interwoven understanding of allegiance to God or allegiance to her countrymen? Friends, God is giving you the courage to face the fear of breaking allegiance with the world. See, it's from that that the, the author of Hebrews tells us all of those grand stories of profound victory and loss the courage that it was required to see God move in powerful ways and the courage that's required to suffer unimaginable loss. But it's that picture that actually helps you see there's not just one thing that connects these four stories. There's two things. It's the connection of courage. But it's the connection of courage and allegiance. All four of these stories are stories of allegiance because the substance of faith is inviting you into allegiance. Allegiance is the posture that faith is trying to secure you in. Lens and the team, you can come up. Jesus Everywhere he began his ministry, Mark 1 captures this, but it tells us about this everywhere he went, that Jesus would come and he would speak, repent and believe in me. This phrase has a lot of meaning, very obvious meaning, but I actually think this initial message of Jesus, repent and believe in me, for the kingdom of God is at hand, has some invitation that we often miss. Josephus, who is this um, ancient Roman Jewish historian, he was a military fighter for Israel becomes, switches over, gives his allegiance to Rome, becomes an ambassador, and he writes a bunch of history as he does this. And one of the stories he records as he goes to this tribal area that is causing trouble with Rome, he's basically the last stop. After him, if things don't change, the armies of Rome come. And he comes to plead with the village leaders. And this is the exact phrase he writes as he's talking about his conversation with them. He says, repent and believe in me. It's a pretty unique phrase. When you stop and think about it, he's a contemporary to Paul, so he lives right in this time frame of Jesus. You, you go, man, this phrase that really is only in history and literature connected to the sayings of Jesus. Either Josephus had some kind of messianic view of himself, or maybe this phrase had a bit of a cultural meaning we often miss. I would say it's the latter. See, because when Josephus is standing in front of that village, this is what he's saying. You've picked the wrong allegiance. Trust me, you do not want what comes after me. You give your allegiance to Rome or Rome is gonna come and do things you do not want to do. Now, Josephus says this as a broken man in a broken kingdom with an evil empire wanting to do unimaginably evil things. But in its nature, it's the same picture that Jesus is using. Jesus is standing on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee and what he's actually saying is you've picked the wrong allegiance. The allegiance to your religion, to works, to self-righteousness, the, 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 the allegiance to security and your money, the, the allegiance to your self-effort, the allegiance that you've given yourself to. I'm here to tell you, you have chosen the wrong allegiance. Repent and believe in me. I'm telling you the truth. It's an invitation of allegiance exclusively in the person of Jesus. What faith in its substance is all about is coming to a place of belief in Jesus where we have held on to a place of allegiance that defines everything about our future. No matter how small or large it may be. 
Because when I actually begin to understand, I stand in allegiance with Jesus. Every decision is predecided. I just need the courage to face it. And there's ones that are easy. There's ones that are not so easy. All right, and this is the beauty of the gospels. When, when Paul writes to Timothy, here's a trustworthy saying. And he says, if, if we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny him safe. But if we disown him, he'll disown us. We read that like, I don't know how that fits with the gospel. It feels like a harshness. It's actually one of the most beautiful things you can understand. Because what, what he's saying is when you give your allegiance to Jesus, he'll stay faithful to his allegiance to you when you don't stay faithful to your allegiance to him. It's grace, that's the gospel. But he's also saying, if you actually don't want that allegiance, if you deny your allegiance, and this is getting into other conversations around salvation that are not the point of my message, but what the author of what Paul's saying is, if you actually tell God, I don't want allegiance with you, then God's kind enough to go, okay. You cannot out his allegiance to you. That's grace but it's not saying that the substance of what allegiance is in our lives isn't meaning to call us to a significant way of understanding our life and our future. The, I, when I talk about such things, I say the same story every time. Many of you have heard this, but it always repeats. It's, it's, bare, it's worth repeating. Emily and I will celebrate 20 years in August. Love my wife. Covenant and marriage is the most accurate representation of allegiance that we have in our life and the power I've learned of covenant is not found in my yes. I love my wife. My yes to her is quite easily given, but the power of my covenant to my wife is not my yes. The power of my covenant to my wife is my no. It's that my yes comes with 3.5 billion no's in the world not that many ask, to be fair. <laughs> but, the, but the point stands, my allegiance to Emily is the billions of no's. Your allegiance to Jesus is the billions of no's that keep you in alignment with him. And see, this is what the author of Hebrews is trying to tell you, that faith is coming to this culminating end. And the culminating end is not courage. The culminating end is allegiance. But in the world you live in, allegiance is gonna lead you to moments that are gonna require some courage. Allegiance is gonna lead you to narrow roads where that wide road of self-preservation and self-blessing is so tempting. And yet this call of allegiance says selfless love. I've got to die to me. I've got to walk with Jesus. This, this place of allegiance is going to lead me to moments where I've got a sea in front of me and an army behind me and I am vulnerable and everything inside of me wants to hide it, wants to act like it's not true, wants to tell people I'm doing fine because to admit how vulnerable I am, then who, who am I? Oh, the way we fear the places of vulnerability. But my allegiance to Jesus says I can be vulnerable with him and for him because he was vulnerable with me and for me. Allegiance is gonna lead us to battles I can't win. Or I have to learn how to let God fight them on my behalf. Allegiance is gonna lead me to moments of great consequence in my life, in my home, in my family, in my culture, in my neighborhood, in my city, in my life, where do I give my allegiance? And the cost of what happens when it requires breaking allegiance with the world around me. See, this, this is what faith is inviting us to see. It is doing the work of allegiance in us. Allegiance that will require courage, but it's a courage that the Spirit himself ministers unto you. So you move your life into a place 
of abiding and you find. While faith is not an emotion, when faith starts to wake up, there is one profound emotion that you will find. Courage. Courage to face things you do not want to. Courage to make decisions that are complicated. Courage to allow your covenant with Jesus to create the landscape of your future, no matter what it costs. Friends, following Jesus takes courage. It takes courage. Standing in alignment to the gospel, to the authority of scripture takes courage. To be honest and humble and vulnerable takes courage. To, to obey Jesus and live in patterns of generosity and selflessness takes courage. To love your enemies takes courage. To die to your own sense of reputation takes courage. To believe God takes courage. And this is an hour in our lives and an hour in your life where I want to speak to you Courage, dear heart. Courage. Courage to be faithful to Jesus. Courage to give your allegiance to him. Courage to embrace suffering for selfless love for others. Courage to find the narrow roads. Courage to practice the way of Jesus. Courage to raise your hand when you're hurting. Courage to admit you can't do this on your own. Courage to put your family first if you have kids. Courage to believe God can heal your marriage if you're walking through trials. Courage to stop acting like somehow you have this strength you can just find and pull up and everybody else can't. The strength to believe the gospel. It's courage courage that God wants to give you. So as your pastor, I want to tell you, God is trying to make us strong and courageous. But it starts with being weak and courageous. Paul says, I've learned the art of being weak. He even says, I've learned to love being weak. How could someone say such a thing? He says, oh, but I've, I've come to find this, that when I'm weak, he really is strong. And so the art of strong is this abiding in the one who is. Would you stand with me? I've asked Lindsay and the team today, Knowing that we would go a few minutes over, it was important to me that we would just worship together at the end. And, and here is my invitation to you. If you need courage, if you find yourself on a ship going somewhere that is turning out a little different than you expected and the darkness has fallen and fear and anxiety is ramping up around you, let the Holy Spirit Come and speak courage to your heart. Be strengthened in your inner man. Let God do what only God can do. And it is often in the place of worship where we turn our eyes rightly to Jesus that this strengthening takes place. So just for a few minutes, we're gonna sing. I'll come and I'll send us on our way. But Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father, we need you. Come and strengthen your people in Jesus' name. Come on, church, let's just sing.
never failing Oh It's never failing Sing praise my soul Find strength in joy Let His words work you begin. You will keep your promises. And we hold on to you. Holy Spirit, strengthen your people. Strengthen your people. We love you and we honor you. In Jesus' name. Listen, if the prayer teams will come forward, if we can pray, let us pray. If you in any way feel like you've got a Red Sea in front of you and an army behind you, if you feel like you're on a ship and it just got dark, if you're aware of seasons that just need courage, let's just pray. And uh, if not, I just hope you have an amazing Memorial Day. I had a really funny Joe Rogan story that I didn't put in here, so that'll find its way into another teaching. And uh, I have the weirdest life sometimes. A dinner party at Joe Rogan's house in 2003. But anyways, (laughs) God wants to meet you. My heart is not to preach sermons. It's to open the door to the living God in our lives. He loves you. And let me just remind you of this. When you are faithless, oh, how faithful he remains. Let his faithfulness anchor you. 
and give you courage. May God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he turn his countenance to you. And may you know everywhere you go this week, you are radically loved by Jesus. God bless you, friends. Have a great Memorial Day weekend. If we can pray, let us pray. Uh, If not, just enjoy the rest of your day. God bless you.